Hello again. In this video, I will be talking about the separation of powers. What you will learn is that, unlike the other constitutional principles we will be discussing this week, the legislative supremacy of Parliament and the rule of law, the separation of powers is very much a contested principle. I don't just mean that people disagree over the exact boundaries between it and other principles. I mean that the very status of the separation of powers as one of the guiding principles of the United Kingdom Constitution is contested. I will get to that, but first we should discuss the content of the principle. To introduce the key ideas, I should introduce to you an 18th century Frenchman. Meet Baron Charles de Montesquieu, a French lawyer and aristocrat who travelled in England between 1729 and 1731. And while he was on his travels, Montesquieu wrote an essay on the English Constitution that was later published as part of his major work, The Spirit of the Laws. And in it, Montesquieu praised the English Constitution for its separation of the powers of the executive, represented by the king, the legislature, and the judiciary. When the legislative and executive powers are united in the same person, or in the same body of magistrates, Montesquieu said, there can be no liberty, because apprehensions may arise lest the same monarch or senate should enact tyrannical laws to execute them in a tyrannical manner. In other words, Montesquieu saw the danger, one that had very much materialised in his native pre-revolutionary France, that if the people who created laws were also responsible for their execution, that is, for carrying out the actions contemplated by legislation, then if the laws were despotic, then their execution would be more so. But if a different body of men, and of course nowadays women, were responsible for carrying out the instructions of the legislature in practice, then the harshness of the laws could be moderated. The same went for Montesquieu, for the separation of the judiciary from the legislature and the executive. Again, he said, there is no liberty if the judiciary power be not separated from the legislative and executive. Were it joined with the legislative, the life and liberty of the subject would be exposed to arbitrary control, for the judge would th then be the legislator. Were it joined to the executive power, the judge might behave with violence and oppression. In other words, a key safeguard of the liberties of the people for Montesquieu was that the interpretation of the law was in the hands of a different body of men and women from those who were responsible for passing legislation or carrying out legislative instructions. The key insight here is that having power divided between different bodies of men and women and between different institutions limits the opportunities for overreach that is, for powers to be ex exercised beyond their proper limits. It provides checks and balances to restrain any impulse on the part of state institutions to act in a despotic way. These insights were not completely new. The English philosopher John Locke had drawn attention to the importance of the separation of legislative and executive power. In his second treatise on government, published in 1689, Locke said that, in well-ordered commonwealths, where the good of the whole is considered as it ought, the legislative power is put into the hand of diverse persons who, duly assembled, have by themselves or jointly with others, a power to make laws which they have done, being separated again, they are themselves subject to the laws they have made. Now I think one of the most important things I can do is to put these thoughts in their proper historical context because it is often claimed that Montesquieu misunderstood our constitution. Somehow Locke seems to have got away more lightly in comparison, I don't know why. But anyway, the charge against Montesquieu, at least in the more simplistic versions that I have seen, is that in the British constitution, powers are joined or fused rather than separated. After all, executive powers are typically exercised or at least overseen by ministers who sit in Parliament. We owe that insight to the 19th century constitutional commentator Walter Badgett. We'll come back to Badgett in a couple of weeks when we look at executive government. 
Anyway, Badgett described the cabinet as a combining committee, a hyphen which joins, a buckle which fastens the legislative part of the state to the executive part of the state. In other words, while we might speak of the separation of legislative and executive powers, in our constitution, the most important holders of executive office are also members of parliament, usually nowadays members of the House of Commons rather than peers. Think of the Prime Minister, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and the various Secretaries of State and Ministers that are members of Cabinet. What you have to remember, I think, is that Badgett was writing nearly 150 years after Montesquieu, and our Constitution had evolved considerably in that time. The dominance that the executive nowadays typically exerts over Parliament had yet to take shape. So Montesquieu was quite accurately describing the constitution as it existed in his time, not in ours. The executive in Montesquieu's time was the old executive of the king in council, the privy council as it was known, a largish body of the monarch's most trusted advisers. This was distinct from what we now know as cabinet, which was then only just beginning to emerge as an informal dinner meeting of those MPs who agreed to do the King's bidding in Parliament. I acquired some insight into how this 18th century separation of powers worked in practice when I did some research into the constitutions of the Commonwealth Caribbean. Until the 19th century, many of our former colonies in the Caribbean had constitutions based on the 17th century English one. They were known as the old representative system. In fact, R R Barbados retained this constitutional structure right up to independence in 1966. It was, of course, only representative in a very limited sense. In 1938, for example, in Barbados, there were only 5,000 electors in a population of 200,000. And as you can probably guess, there was an ethnic dimension to this, not an explicit one, but this was one of the legacies of plantation slavery and the sugar economy. The point for now is that Barbados gives an illustration, within living memory, of the separation of legislative and executive powers as it operated in a system based on the British 17th century separation of powers. Executive power was in the hands of a governor who was appointed by and was the sole representative of the monarch. He was assisted by an executive privy council, better known as the executive council, also appointed by the crown. Legislative power was vested in an assembly, and the assembly alone had the power to pass laws, including the annual finance act, which provided funds to the governor and his administration. So the governor was not in any formal sense accountable to the assembly. Accountability of the executive to the legislature is a key feature of what is known as responsible government. In the colonial context, responsible government in this sense first emerged in Canada in the 20 years or so prior to Confederation. And if we read the history, such as Hume Wrong's 1923 book, The Government of the West Indies, I read that one so you don't have to, you will get the sense of how the old representative system worked in practice. The picture you get from Rong's book, Rong incidentally was a Canadian and a future Canadian ambassador to the US, was that this constitutional setup was a recipe for dysfunctional government. The governor was not in any formal sense responsible or accountable to the assembly, but he was dependent on it for the passage of laws and for voting funds to the administration. And as Rong put it, the power of refusing supplies was the one weapon which the assembly employed against the governor and council. So though it had no formal role in government oversight, the assembly used this power of the purse to exercise a sort of informal control indirectly and behind closed doors. The governor, for his part, continually had to choose between falling out with the assembly or disobeying the instructions from the crown. There were, of course, similar clashes between the Crown and Parliament over taxation in the 17th century. But the Caribbean experience is interesting, I think, because it shows how difficult it was to maintain a strict separation of power into the modern era of administrative government. 
If you want to delve more deeply, you can read my chapter with Martin Lodge in the Oxford Handbook of Caribbean Constitutions and my article in the August 2020 Northern Ireland Legal Quarterly, also with Martin Lodge. Although neither of these readings should be considered essential for this introductory public law module. So what of the present day Constitution of the United Kingdom? I hope my excursus into the history of West Indian government underscores for you the idea that the constitutional system of which John Locke and Baron de Montesquieu spoke is not the one that we have now. And I hope that I have brought to your attention some of the difficulties that the country would face if we tried to practice the modern government according to a strict interpretation of the separation of powers. Modern administrative government requires a greater degree of coordination than is compatible with a strict separation. So what do we practice? Badgett, perhaps, does a slightly better job of capturing the relationship between the legislature and the modern executive, in which control of executive powers is vested in cabinet, chaired by the prime minister and consisting of the most important ministers. Badgett described the cabinet and cabinet government as the efficient secret of the British constitution. Because the most important executive roles were held by individuals who were also members of parliament, the paralysis and inter-institutional conflict that we saw in the West Indian colonies in the 19th century was mostly avoided at home. Ministers were in parliament and they knew its mind, what it would tolerate and what it would not, and frankly what they could get away with. But I think Badgett rather overstates it when he talks about the close union, the nearly complete fusion of legislative and executive powers. Instead, what we have is closer to what MJC Vial calls partial separation of the personnel of government and a partial separation of the function of government. You will see in chapter 4 of the textbook, Elliot and Thomas, that they talk about the partial version of the separation of powers doctrine. The partial version accepts that the classification of powers into legislative, executive and judicial does not neatly correspond to the role now played by Parliament, Cabinet and the courts. But it would ascribe significance to the fact that when the executive wields legislative power, as it does, for example, when the Secretary of State makes delegated legislation under powers given by statute, that it does so in accordance with limits imposed by Parliament. In my mini-lecture on the rule of law, I give an example of where these limits are reduced to a bare minimum. So much for the separation of legislative and executive powers. What about the separation of legislative and judicial power? I want to turn briefly to the judgment of Lord Diplock, in a case called Duport Steel and Sirs. Lord Diplock said in that case, it cannot be too strongly emphasised that the British constitution, though largely unwritten, is firmly based upon the separation of powers. It was the separation of powers between the legislature and the judiciary that Lord Diplock was getting at. Parliament makes the law, the judiciary interpret them, he said. You will read extracts from that judgment for your first seminar. I won't go into details on the facts of the case, but it involves the interpretation of controversial trade union legislation and whether a trade union could be said to be acting in furtherance of a trade dispute when it participated in a sympathy strike. In other words, it was taking action not against British Steel, the company which the union was in dispute with, but with another private steel producer in order to put pressure on British steel indirectly. Lord Diplock was not willing to correct what he saw as an evident mischief in the legislation, because this was a matter for Parliament, not for the courts. It undermined continued confidence in the political impartiality of the judiciary, Lord Diplock thought, if, under the guise of interpretation, judges provided their own preferred amendments to statutes, even if they considered the result of a plain meaning reading to be absurd. The most important takeaway point here is that some version of the principles of the separation of powers influences the way judges decide cases. 
But if you want to read more about Diplock's judicial philosophy and some of the concerns underlying it, you can read my article with T.T. Arvin, The Curious Origins of Judicial Review. The final point I would like to make is that the principle of separation of powers saw something of a renaissance around the turn of the millennium. The constitutional reforms of the government of Tony Blair, in particular, sought to reinforce the separation of legislative, executive and judicial powers. The Constitutional Reform Act 2005, for example, abolished the judicial functions of the Lord Chancellor. The Lord Chancellor, you may remember, until that time also occupied the role of Speaker of the House of Lords and was a member of Cabinet. The Constitutional Reform Act also set up a UK Supreme Court so that the House of Lords no longer sits as a judicial body. This, incidentally, is a reform of which Badgett would have been proud. Our highest court, he said, ought to be a conspicuous tribunal and not hidden beneath the robes of the Legislative Assembly. The judiciary also played a role. As a result of a case called Anderson, the Home Secretary no longer plays a role in criminal sentencing decision. So the idea of the separation of powers, or perhaps, as we have said, the idea of the partial separation of powers, continues to exert an influence on the development of our Constitution, as well as influencing how judges and other constitutional actors see their role. I'll see you in the next video.